I tell people all the time, I've been trying to quit kayaking for 30 years now, you know, and it's just a part of me. It'll, I'll always be involved with it, and, you know, there was a, a time when I really didn't accept, I didn't think that was acceptable, but now I think it's necessary. Yeah. So. Here we are. Gonna let you know what's going on. This behind me is what we think is Cherry Bomb Falls. Never been run until this morning. How do you feel about that? I'm fired up. Fired up. I'm fired up about this and the fact that we have 40, 30, 20 footer <laughs> right there. Uh -huh. Hey, how are you guys doing? Good. Anybody Good. been fishing today? No. No, no fishing? We did. We did. Hey, Chelsea. Good. I can't wait to see uh, what you guys have done to this place. So, John Grace, here we are on the banks of the Green River, below the Narrows, on what we call the Lower Green. And uh, you and your family, you and Chelsea, bought this cabin. What? 16, 18 months ago? Yep, a year and a half ago, something like that. And when I heard you did that, it just reinforced my impression that the Green River is very special to you, almost spiritual in some ways. You, your life is so connected to the Green River. Does that sound right? Yeah, I've had a lot of formative years here, but the river itself, I've spent so much time there, so much time up in that canyon that, uh, I don't know. I just always like to come here. So. You've made such a difference in the world of whitewater paddling in the southeastern U.S. and the southern Appalachians on different fronts. And we'll talk about that in this interview. But... So we, we made our way down here to the green. Uh, but no, this is cool. This is a part of the this property we bought, the Green River Ranch. You can see that rapid down there. Yeah. This is paradise. This is paradise right here. And it's an honor to interview you. And by the way, my name is Mark Hunt. I uh, have volunteered to produce some interviews for the Southern Appalachian Paddle Sports Museum. And so the purpose of this, John, is to kind of grab your thoughts and stories and a little bit about your life and highlight the impact you've had on paddling in this part of the country. And uh, hopefully it'll be memorialized for a long time and maybe 30 years from now when you're closer to my age. Actually, I'm not 30 years ahead of you. I'm a little... You know, somebody, somebody else will come along and interview you. Maybe I'll come along. I'll be 85, and we'll interview you, you when you're 65. And or maybe I'll interview you. Oh, there we go. <laughs> no, I appreciate it, Mark. I'm excited to, you know, kind of offer what I can. I mean, it's hard from my seat to see it as super interesting, but, you know, hopefully somebody will get some value out of it. I promise you there are people that find it interesting. So, the Green River, John, um... There's a community of dear friends and families that are connected that have actually sort of, some people have moved to this part of the country, perhaps you guys, to be close to the Green River and to build lives around the community of paddlers and adventurers here. Reflect on that a little bit for me. I mean, it, how does that fit into your life? Well, I'm one of those people. I mean, I was born in Indiana. Um, I would come down to this area as a kid and... As a kid, I had a lot of formative experiences down here, um, but really when, uh, you know, really in my late teens, early 20s, when the bug for paddling, it's beyond like bit me, it kind of consumed me at that point. Um, the time I spent down here and, you know, the triumphs and struggles, and it's everything of a good story. Man versus nature, man versus man, the competitions of the races, you know, and you just uh, share all these different experiences, and they're around this one canyon, this one river. Yeah. And so, 
you know, and as far as, as the green and the community goes, it's not, it's a, it's, it's a hard river. So, so it weeds. It's class five. Yeah, it's class five. It's a hard river. And what, what that does inadvertently is weeds out a certain group of paddler or kind of paddler. So it's kind of like a filter. So you take a hundred percent of kayakers and you put them out on various rivers and they have various classes where they live and whatever and you take the Green River and it basically filters out all but about 10%. And it's amazing how those 10% are so much like you and share the same passions and want the same things out of the sport, out of kayaking. And I mean, you know, it really is like, you know, Mama Green, you know. And when you're, when, when we're on the river, above difficult white water, four plus five, and we're with people. There's a special bond that must be in place. I mean, there's, there's a lot of trust uh, that has to occur because we're looking out for each other. We're, it, it's all about keeping ourselves safe. And so we, we have this special connection that, where we bond together because we, we need to trust each other and we ultimately do and we find ways to support each other on the river. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's not a team sport in the fact that you're kayaking on your own, but everyone has those same thoughts going in their head. You know, what if I mess this up? What if I get caught in that hole? You know, and that shared thought, that that shared perspective, you actually paddle as a team. You know, you're working and going to a place where you can assist the next guy, and you're always spotting each other. Um, it's more of a team sport than an individual sport than you think. The legacy of. Uh Whitewater paddling here in the Southern Appalachians. You know, it starts with Section 3 of the Chattooga and the Nantahala. And the lower green right here, actually, mm -hmm. summer camps kind of pioneered it. Yeah. And, gosh, by the time I was slowing down in my paddling activities in the late 1980s, nobody was running the green. I think it was the fall of 1988 when a group of people came down here and to check it out, knowing there were dam releases to... To, to build. So the sport has really shifted. And that's one interesting thing about this interview today is uh, the current state of paddling in the South is very different from what it was in the 70s and early 80s. Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. Big time. Skills. Talk about the things that have helped transition to the difficult. Why the difficult, challenging whitewater is so appealing. Well, let me start. My first kayak was a... 13 foot, 3 inch long laser, laser bat Kevlar racing boat. There were very few plastic boats at that time. And that year was? Um, that was 1986. So there were very few plastic boats around. I believe there was the Dancer that had just come around at that time and then the Dancer XS. I believe Noah made a boat, the Jetty. But really that was about it. Um, and everybody still at that time, or a large group of people, had their composite boats. Everybody either made them or had someone make them. Everybody was skilled in fiberglass and repairing their boats. Paddles were all custom made. There were hardly any paddles. The, the, the real, I mean, the best paddles at that time came from Europe. And it was hard to come by any kind of dry gear or anything like that. So it was totally a... Uh, a pioneer sport when I was a little kid and and then and it was great it was awesome you'd go out and you know there was this squirt boating culture that was around even back then you know, oh, yeah. were making their squirt boats and whatever and I remember going to the Nantahala as a little kid and, and uh, it was just interesting seeing it was a very quick growth phase for the sport as far as technology boats the designs and whatnot because literally you'd have one season you'd come back there'd be a different boat shorter totally different design something you had to have and then you know there'd be another season go by and you'd be like oh wow they've introduced this and then all of a sudden you would have nice gear and then all of a sudden the gear went from not only being dry to being fashionable and you know just everything changed i was i really feel like i was right there on the cusp from when I started on Whitewater at around 10 years old up to when I was, 
I don't know, 22, 23, I really got to see the evolution. I mean, it's still evolving. The sport is yeah. still evolving. But that was an explosion. That was time. an explosion. An explosion of different crafts, specialty. You know, there was no just play boat, you know, back then or whatever. It was You just had your kayak. And all of that. There was no different kinds of paddles. There was no life jackets for this or for that. It was just, you know. So your dad, your dad was... Uh, he was into paddling, and you would travel here to the from Indiana to the uh, Southern Appalachians to the Okoe and Nantahala yep. and Chattooga, and ultimately okay. the Grain. And your dad was a big part of that. Yeah, I got to give a, sh- a huge shout out to my dad and the Ohio Valley Whitewater Club. Um, some of the most loyal weekend warriors you would ever know. I mean, they would do a winter trip with Ken Castorf and Endless River Adventures every year. They would either do a Grand Canyon trip or some other trip. I bet they were traveling 40 weekends a year, always do three or four golly weekends. And my dad was part of that crew, and the way they evolved was they were whitewater canoeists. And my dad came down to the Nantahala and saw some people in a kayak. It turns out, at that time, it was Ken Castorf. But they, nobody knew that, whatever. And they saw him whipping around in his kayak. And my dad was like, oh, i got to get one of those. So he went home, told my mom, came back down the next weekend, bought a kayak, brought it home. No instruction, no anything. And my <laughs> first memories, my very first memories of kayaking are, is my dad in a lake. He had read a book. He had bought a book on rolling. And just swimming and carping rolls and looking like he was going to drown. Like every time he tried to roll, I swear, I was like on the side of the bike. I was like, oh no, don't try it again. He was like, I'm going to do it again. And he'd get up and he would ask my mom, who knew nothing about kayak, and, and he would say, was I doing what they did in the book? And she would read and they'd end up in this inevitable argument or whatever. And she would like stomp off and I'd be like, oh, don't do it anymore. You're scaring me. But eventually he figured it out. And, you know, those guys were some early pioneers, you know. They built the, you know, they had one guy who had a, basically a boat, boat building set up in their garage. And they'd go beat them up on the weekends, meet on Tuesday or Wednesday, fix them, and go out and do it again. Yeah, that's, that's the sport as I knew it when, yeah. I, when I was evolving, for sure. Including the learn, teaching yourself to roll. I had a... I had an book, instruction book, and I put it on the deck of the swimming pool right on the edge. And the, good, you know, the advantage I had over your dad was I could push up off the hard bottom. He was in the mud down no, there. He swam time. every time. I didn't have to swim. But he eventually so, got it. But he only had it on one side for life. I don't know anybody who, I mean, everybody has a good side, but you know, he only had one side roll for many, many years. And then he got the other side. I don't know what happened. Yeah, he must have to keep the proper side downstream when he was sideways in a hole, right? But one more thing to add to that is, uh, yeah, exactly. Plan your surfs accordingly. But uh, one thing i got to add to that is that group of guys who took me under their wing um, were just amazing. They, I mean, they, you looking back as an adult now and having kids, the way they changed their behavior when I was around and kept everything PG and, you know, just, they were just awesome through that period of time well as i've talked to many many paddlers you know our stories are very similar bitten by the bug or as you said m- more deeply consumed than, than bitten <laughs> consumed and then a, a, a network of friends and colleagues and people that would support each other to help elevate into the sport and that's that community you know that's what that's and you know you that's at the very start of it but then you go to the green, and it's someone going from four to five, and people are bringing you under your wing and working with you, and that whole same community that gets people bitten or consumed, it just takes it to another level here. So, John, let's let's talk about your pursuits. Once you you got skills, uh, I'm going to go ahead and spill the beans and let the viewers know that you were National Geographic Adventurer of the Year. In what year? That was 2005. And that's across all endeavors, not just paddling, in in the view of the magazine. And that was because you and some good friends of yours uh, took on the challenge to travel internationally to very remote places, especially for that time, Uh, take airplanes in, hike for two or three days in occasionally, and do first descents. 
And you have a total of how many first descents in your resume now? If you want to talk about rivers, you know, for like a, an unexplored section of river, I don't know, 40, I, I think 43 is 43. what I counted when you... And by the time you there. got to class four skill level, there were thousands of paddlers that were adventuring out and trying to find places. And you and your pals, Tommy Hillicky, Jason Hale, Daniel, Daniel Dale Laverne, yeah. uh, several others just said, hey, let's let's go to the far corners of the earth and the continent and, and find places. So, um, and of course, so, a little of that is here in the Southern Alps. Uh, Toxaway River, you guys did a first descent there. The, and we're talking about right below Toxaway Dam, that that gorge that has all the uh, all the earth and trees stripped off of it, the, the bedrock gorge that you can see from the bridge looking down. Uh, Raven's Fork, maybe? You know, uh, we were the first to do the Raven Fork from the top all the way through. Right. Alan Braswell, Eric Young, and maybe one other person did a, sh a shorter section yeah. before um, we went in there. But for the bulk, for the whole river, we were definitely the, the yeah. first group to ever And, yeah, the Raven's Fork was a, the lower Raven, Raven's Fork, class 3, 3 minus. <laughs> Very popular with camp groups and so on through the years. But, uh, you know, it was un unheard of it. Anybody would oh, it's go amazing. further upstream. It's a world class canyon up there. It's yeah. a world class, you know, two miles of white water up there. Yeah. And so we're doing that in the south, in the southern Appalachians, uh, but you set your sights further out. So um, the, 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 the uh, memorable two or three expeditions you did or challenges you took on, what would those be? Well, I mean, if you want to talk about first ascents, there are several rivers, or, there are several canyons or sections of rivers that people had explored. Yeah. I either was that person who ran those rapids first or I was part of the group right. that ran them. There's West Cherry Creek. It's what the homeboys are going to run tomorrow. I wonder if somebody's gonna run that slide. That is a humongous slide. The boys are camped right over that hill somewhere. Sun's going down. California. How fast do you think you went? I don't know. I have no idea. Did 26 you... miles an hour. On a, on a scale of 1 to 10, how scared were you? I was scared. The, what, no, what, what scale of 1 to 10? I was a 9.3 scared factor. <laughs> I was pretty scared. Here we are. Gonna let you know what's going on. This behind me is what we think is Cherry Bomb Falls. Never been run until this morning. How do you feel about that? I'm fired up. Fired up. I'm fired up about this and the fact that we have 40, 30, 20 footer <laughs> right there. Oh, dude.
to talk about just full rivers that had never been explored. One of the ones that always will stand out to me is the Mambu Caba in Brazil. Ah. And this was a river that we went down there, uh, had a big group that went down there, and we had a local guy who was our guide. Oh. And Brazil. I ended up finding this river, the Mambu Caba, and I was like, Pedro, have you ever heard anybody kayaking? And he was like, oh, no, nobody's ever been in there, you know, whatever it was. Like, well, it looks like we can access it by this road. And he was like, okay, well, we can go up there. And sure enough, we went through a whole rigmarole and found this farm where they had some donkeys and they took our stuff to the river and we took off on this multi-day river trip in the Brazilian jungle on this river, the Mambu Caba. And what made it special is the thing about exploratory kayaking is you always see it portrayed as glamorous and this incredible thing. But most of the time you're just portaging, you're stuck above canyons, you're sweating, it's super manky. You get to these sections you thought were gonna be great, but it's all sieved out. That's the reality of it. Very few times are you on a first ascent and you just find really great runnable white water. In the but we dropped in there and it was almost all runnable. The Mambu Kava. I don't recommend it to anybody. <laughs> I'm serious, man. We hiked and hiked and donkeys and we went bushwhacking through the jungle and I have not located any poisonous spiders or snakes, but I don't know what they look like, but I saw a lot of other stuff out there. I mean, my hands are wrecked. Everybody's still smiling, but it's because we pretty much just dropped about a thousand feet <laughs> via bushwhacking, via some farmer trail that I'd like to get. I think that one just stands out because number one, it was incredible whitewater. Number two, it wasn't by chance, but it was sort of by chance that we decided to take on that run. So that one really That's, stands it, out. What you're describing is sort of the, the quintessential adventure. Yeah. Adventure implies exploration and yeah. problem solving. Yeah. And, and you know, is even now, the generation now that's doing exploratory kayaking around uh, the southeast, like, you know, you have like, uh, Ryan McAvoy and Michael Ferraro going up and running. You have to go more and more obscure creeks and more and more obscure whitewater to find good stuff. Right. This was a big river that had never been explored. Yeah. So that in itself makes it. And so, out. you know the some of the, your other outings that I've heard about. Uh, you and Tommy Hillick, you were the first people to run the Stikine in a single day. Stikine is class five, big burly water. Yeah. How many miles? That was what we were nominated for National Geographic Adventure of the Year. Okay. So it's a 60 mile run. In a single day. Yeah, and it had been run, I don't know, before we went up there in 2004, I think it had been run maybe a half dozen times total. <laughs>
we went back the next year and um, ran the whole thing in a day. It's normally a three-day expedition. Yeah. Started and early, no doubt. <laughs> started early, you know, had a good day, nine hours, 53 minutes. Um, we ran the whole the whole section. And that really opened our eyes. There was a formative trip in 2002 that really opened our eyes, but that was another one that really opened our eyes to, um, I hate to say it or bring it back to the green, but like, you know, it was like paying the dividends of, of what we had done here on the home waters. Yeah. Just building bomb, skills. Just mad confidence. Yeah, mad bombing, racing the whole section of the narrows, linking this up to that up to that up and just seeing like, you know. So we're, middle we're, middle fork of the kings or middle kings in the high Sierra, Cal, northern California is another single day uh, accomplishment. Yeah. And so, you know, actually the so the middle fork of the kings was Tommy's idea. He said, we should go do the Middle Fork of the Kings. And by the way, Tommy Hillicky. Tommy Hillicky. Grew up in Alabama. Alabama. Lives in Colorado now. Uh, but was in, in, at the center of the core group of friends that you, oh, yeah. you elevated with. Yeah, it was me, Tommy, Daniel, Nate Helms, a, a core group of people for several years. Daniel De Laverne. Daniel De Laverne. And, you know, Daniel was really the leader of our posse in several ways. Um, he, I could talk about Daniel forever, um, but in the Middle Kings, we were in Jason Hale's driveway one day. He wasn't there, but uh, we were doing some work on his house actually. And Tommy was like, "Dude, we should do Middle Kings in a day." And I was like, "Oh, that's a five-day trip." I was like, "We should start with the Stikine." And Daniel was like, "Dude, shut up, man. Whatever, blah, blah, blah. And you know, but. After that conversation, Tommy and I never quit talking about it. So we went up there with a big group. Unbeknownst to Daniel or anyone else, um, we were we vaguely talked about it. But the whole time on that first trip, we were we were marking down their times between each rapid and taking out the breaks, the stopping and filming, you know, whatever. So, you know, we did like a you know, a seven hour first day, but when we broke it down, we were only kayaking whitewater for two and a half hours. Yeah. And then we did the next day and we broke it down and whatever and it was like three hours. And then we broke down the next day and it was like three and a half hours. And so we were like we did the math on that and we were like, well, if we get up early and we don't stop, we can paddle. Well and you you've, you've, you've got the moves wired, the where to portage, where exactly. to, you know what what you can run. Exactly. You know, All what, of that had been worked out like we knew the exact beach we were going to stop on you know we knew exactly where we were going to get out of our boats exactly what rock we were going to slide in with our boats the whole nine yards and so we did that trip and then we got done and that's when you know it's such a funny story that morning you know we put out a stick it was high water and we put out a stick and i think tommy and i were the only ones you're talking about a a makeshift gauge yeah, we put on, a, on the bank yeah, we, to, to see if the water rises Exactly. Falls. So it was high water that trip. Our first trip was super high water. And we were, you know, we but we traveled all the way up there. We had spent all this time. We had this goal. We had been training and getting ready for it. And we wake up the next morning and, you know, we put the stick in and we had an agreement. We're like, if the water drops from the gauge, if the water drops at all, we'll do it. Because it was right on the high side of what you wanted to do it. But if it comes up, we're not going to do it. That was kind of the group consensus. And I got up. I got up that morning. I looked at the gauge, and it had dropped like one inch. You know, this is a big river with yeah, you know fifteen thousand yeah. CFS. You know, so one inch really isn't that much water. But anyway, it had dropped like one inch, and I remember going down to the beach with my headlamp, and I looked down, and I saw the 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 gauge had went down, and I said, "It's dropped." And Daniel in his tent goes, "Fuck." <laughs> I don't have to edit that out. <laughs> but, but anyway, yeah, we geared up. Toby McDermott, uh, Daniel De Laverne, Tommy, and myself, and went down and made it. And uh, that really, you know, then we started thinking about what other runs could we do that? You know, could we so back it as you were evolving as a paddler, you were evolving as a media person too. You you got uh, video cameras of that day, which are not GoPros, and 
uh, filmed some of these outings best you could, usually from shore, I assume, because the GoPro wasn't around yet, right? And then um, figured out you could put these videos together into productions. And that led to uh, an enterprise called Lunch Video Magazine, which was a series of, what, 30-some-odd? 30 37 DVDs. Total DVDs. This was before YouTube. That people well, it was VHS at first. Okay. You know, the first four were VHS. Yeah. Um, and then at, at issue five, it moved. And I remember you could subscribe, and you would get you would get the next episode. Yeah, it was Netflix for the time. Yeah. It was the it was Netflix, and you know it was uh, there were several contributors early on. You know, the LVM was started by uh, Spencer Cook and Daniel DeLaverne. And I was just a contributor, you know, from oh, the first, okay. from the very first um, episode. I can, you know, I contributed a bunch of Ravens Fork footage and a bunch of other places I'd been. I was like, yeah, this is awesome, and you know, and and it's went from there. And then when uh, Daniel DeLaverne passed away, that is when I um, took over the company. I gotcha. And I mean, it was, you know. LVM was, at that time, the way you could distribute content, you couldn't do it with any kind of quality through the internet that wasn't available. Right. You couldn't watch a YouTube. YouTube was available, but the videos on there were like so bad, you could barely. And short. Very short. And, and so this was the only way to get whitewater content. And there was a dedicated group of people who were contributing and it was a it was a super cool project for many years. Well, I remember at the time, so many skilled paddlers that I knew would talk about watching the LVM DVDs and becoming inspired themselves to go run, figure out how to run the Ravensport, get their skills up to do that, or Toxaway or or Middle Kings or somewhere, yeah. and. Uh, and it was pivotal, pivotal in the evolution of the sport. So, John, Lunch Video Magazine, and that, by the way, now it's on Vimeo, which is like YouTube, and people can subscribe to that. And it's, I had such a great time a couple of weeks ago. You put it out there on social media. It was available, and I had bought the package up. I need to, but I saw one of your previews, and here's you and Tommy and Jason. And I mean, you look as young as you always have, but those guys look a lot younger than they are now. <laughs> But, uh, so, uh, somehow you were inspired, I suspect, from LVM to expand and do much broader things in media. I mean, you told me last week you, you're filming swim meets, competitive Olympic uh, level swim meets in the South as people try to qualify for the Olympics and uh, an off-road four-wheel drive competition out in the desert out west and so on. But, but you've, you've maintained a focus on whitewater. Uh, with media production, you you do work for the industry for boat manufacturers, mm -hmm. paddle manufacturers, and all. Um, talk about and the, the name of your company is Amongst It. Amongst It, yep. Yeah, talk a little bit about that. I mean, that's that's your work, that's your job, that's your employment these days. Yeah. So, Amongst It is a content marketing company, and what that means is producing valuable content consistently over time. So, LVM is a content marketing thing because it comes out consistently it adds value inspires people and it, and it and it happens over time and we took that skill set and when modern internet came along and various things and we took that and we allowed companies you know we provided companies the ability and the skill set and the work to be able to do that it goes kind of beyond just normal video production there's kind of a deeper plan to it but through that time if, if you can go out on a river in the middle of nowhere, keep it together while you're above the savage rapids and whatever you got to deal with and weather and the whole nine yards and grabbing your friend out of the river and swimming and whatever it takes and bring that back and put it together and then get it out to the stores, you've developed a pretty solid skill set. And that has turned into what, I mean, for lack of a better term, you know, that's that's what we do for a living now. And whitewater is always, I'm always interested in whitewater, but 
it's very difficult to make a living yeah. off whitewater. So for me, taking that skill set and whatnot that we've I've developed over the years, I can do side projects and things within whitewater and it keeps me engaged and I really enjoy it. It's fulfilling. Sometimes you do work for clients and you do it and you're happy that they liked it and whatever, but it doesn't really yeah. fulfill you. I know you know, exactly you know what I'm saying? So, but when I do any kind of project in Whitewater, even if it pays 30% of whatever, I get more fulfillment as long as my wife, you know, lets me. <laughs> well, and by the way, we should mention Chelsea Grace, who is... Um, in some ways, the glue that holds the empire together. I mean, yeah. she is a logistics wizard, and she keeps the trains running, and you provide vision. She's visionary, too. I mean, together, you guys make such a great team. And, you know, this this Green River Ranch where we are is a testament to, you know, how you guys assemble a great life out of these various pieces. And one of the pieces is events. Um, you put on several races and uh, events every year, uh, including one wheel competition events. And But the biggest is probably the green race. And the green race um, preceded you a little bit. You probably raced in some of the early ones. But Leland Davis and maybe Chris Bell sort of got it rolling in the early days. And after just a few years, you took over the chairmanship of it, which was purely volunteer. And, and well, the you know, talk about the numbers of racers then and now. Well, the way that happened is Leland was the first person to throw it out there. And like all good things, it was probably at the bar after a couple beers. And it was basically, I'll, I'll race the whole thing, and there's no way you're going to beat my con. And it was, you know, Jason Hale was like, whatever, you know, I'll do that. And, you know, everybody decided they were going to race, and it happened. And... Then Leland kind of grew tired of it, and Jason took it over, and he did a good job. Um, but there was never, you know, it was, there was just a real opportunity to, I guess, engage the community a little bit more mm -hmm. with the race. And Jason moved to California in uh, 2006, and he said, you know, the race is yours. I said, look, I'll do it. I want to do it, but you have to come back every year. That's the deal. And he's, he's been there every he's year. He's been there every year. And so he, you know, basically was like, all right, this is your thing. And so I drew Chelsea in. I said, she, we, had, we weren't married at that point. I said, we're going to do this race, and this is what we're going to do, and this is going to happen, and, you know, we're going to change this and, and whatnot. And she was on board with it, and she put up with Jason and I's bantering and all the venom that comes out and just, like, <laughs> you know, getting all fired up about everything. But when I first took over the race, the year before, there were, I think we had 43 people um, that the year before. And then I just did some, like, you know, just basic promotion, started talking about ways to go faster and ways to help people you know, really put a good time in and it's put a little bit more effort. And I I think one of the big things that really brought it to notoriety, notoriety and it's kind of a simple thing, is I hung a zip line going down uh, from the top of Gorilla all the way through to the top of um, Nisa's Pieces there. Mm. And I went out there and filmed the race from this thing. And... That footage, no footage had ever been seen like that of Whitewater, of actually the camera moving with the kayaker. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people got a lot more interested in it. And they were like, wow, because all you would see is little tidbits of whatever. Yeah. But this is where you could see, like, oh, my God, those guys are racing through all that stuff. It was the first time that it had connected sections of the river, and people got a real feel for what it was. And, and to put it in context, we're talking about the Green River Narrows, uh, a race that ranges anywhere from four minutes and five seconds up to about six, six and a half, depending on how it goes. Well, yeah. And yeah, it's a big deal to break five minutes. And it is through the uh, most of the very toughest rapids on the run. It did in the entire length of the Narrows. And nowadays, um, the, the number of people on shore watching, I mean, it is a spectator sport. Oh, yeah. Uh, 
you know, that is second to none. I've, I've told friends that go to the Super Bowl and watch that and come go to the green race and you tell me what you like better. And the green race is pretty awesome. It's the greatest show in all of sports. And I started first started saying that because at that time people were like, it's an extreme race and it's whatever. And I remember when they did the first X Games and they were like, it's an extreme sport competition. And they had like some super rad sports in there, like the skateboarding and the vert. But then they had like bungee jumping and all this stuff that didn't make any sense. And it just turned me off to extreme, the word extreme. And I right. was like, no, no, no. This has nothing to do with Kai. This is the greatest show in all sports. All right, here we go. Still to this day, people are like, why don't you do a live feed out of there, you know, whatever. And I'm like, no, no, you got to earn it. you got to get in there. You pay your dues. It's like, it's class five hiking. It's class five spectating. It's class five kayaking, you know. And that, like I kind of talked about earlier, weeds out a certain group. So the people who are in there are so similar and so that place and rivers are so important to them there's just very little trash everybody's considerate of what's going on and it's just uh you know it's just a thing it's it's a it is a thing and you know now we have 175 racers every year there's probably 2,000 who participate in the race one way or the other through the weekend you know we have a party. spectators we, or competitors yeah or, we or, have a, Volunteers. Exactly. We have a festival that happens here where we have eight or nine hundred people who come down and camp out. So, um, you know, and it's just, uh, it's a thing. I don't know how else to say it. Well, and you, uh, I've been amazed at how you get cranked up and you race like a demon in that thing every year while you're running the show. And of course, Chelsea is not racing. She's on the shore making sure stuff comes together. But you've been top ten nearly every year you've raced in it right i've been top top 10 several years yeah i've got third twice uh, never won it but i love to race and for me it's a litmus test of just clean living it's just i i can tell if i've been working out eating right got my head on straight you know and for me personally lining up at the start line is you gotta have clear vision and it's just uh, well. Here we are in May 2020. Yeah. The next green race is the first Saturday in November at high noon. Yeah. And you're already thinking about your training. You've already been yeah. battling a bunch. Yeah. And you're gonna gear your training starts th after the Fourth of July for me. You know. Yeah. So it's like I make sure I'm in my bed at least three or four days a week at that point. You know. Start thinking about it and. No, it's all consuming, you know. I don't I don't know when I'm going to quit loving it, but man, it is definitely I mean, and you know, and you get to see all your friends and you get you, know, yeah. you get you know. Well, you, back to the competitive yeah, drive thing. You you, you were a wrestler in college. Yeah, I spent many years wrestling, high school, a little bit in college. High school through my sophomore year of college, I walked away after my sophomore year of college really because I got consumed by kayaking. And it was, I, I've definitely always been competitive. And I think competition, a lot of people are turned off by competition, I've noticed. And not because, I'm not exactly sure why that is. Because competition really brings out the best and the worst in people. But it really peels layers off and, and you know, it's a, it's a super healthy thing. And, you know, so kayaking... And I think that's, you know, I don't, I don't want to get too off topic here, but I think that kayaking, whitewater in particular, you know, people talk about and there's not enough participation in the sport and various things. And I think competition, not so much on class five runs like the green, but there are tons of stretches of water that anyone, if they want to put in the training and they want to put in the time getting fit, can compete at. And then 
you know, that's the kind of person that you that you can reach out to that's a totally different audience than the guy who wants to live out of his van yeah. and whatever, which I love living out of a van and just being on the road. But there's that group that wants to train, they go to gyms, they do all this various thing, and paddling is like superior to almost any kind of workout you're going to get or a full body. in the gym. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that, you know, I just think bringing that, those years of competition and just you know the banter and everything that goes along with it and laying it out there and the bets and just throwing that all into the green race uh it just jazzes well it's, up. it's interesting to me that w when i started paddling in the early 70s slalom was the big thing i mean the way you learned about paddling was fine where the slalom race is and you you just go in or even though you're a rookie and you make mistakes maybe you swim or whatever but there are these great paddlers, these people that have been to Europe, and mm -hmm. these people that went mm -hmm. to the Olympics. And just like today, they're gracious, and they hold your hand and help you with technique, and you, invite you to come train with them if you want. And that's how people built skills in the 70s and into the early 80s. And, um, and then there was sort of a vacuum of competition for a while, it seems, until extreme racing came along. Yes, yeah, slalom continued, but it came... It became a much more expensive sport and a, and a sport that was less accessible to the masses. Um, so I, I love seeing the way the green race inspires people. And inspires competitions. I mean, there's 150 people who race down the Ocoee now. Yeah. You know, just a downward race on the Ocoee. The Nolichucky has 100 racers in it. You know? Russell Fork. Russell yeah. Fork. All of these events. And... Not to say that they wouldn't be as successful without the green race, but people have seen that and been like, hey, you know, whatever, I don't have the Green River Narrows in my backyard, but we got our sick local run, yeah. let's race it. And yeah. people start spending more time on the water, training up and getting ready, and that just, it's an important part of the ecosystem of the industry that I think is often overlooked. John, one, uh, one of your good paddling friends I was talking to recently um, described you as being very special to the sport in the way that you have supported other paddlers, other people that want to come along, build skills at many levels, but especially class four or five skills, especially green racing skills. Um, this person told me how you uh, encouraged them to have a bet with you <laughs> before they thought they were ready. And that was maybe the best thing they said had happened to him in terms of becoming a green racer because then the game was on and in this same spirit of competition that you're describing it was it wasn't the end all of life seriousness that the you know, i'm going to define myself by being a racer it's a small part of what we all do and uh so you're appreciated john for the way you've, you've supported others and not just in paddling but in amongst it in lvm you welcome other video um, uh, artists to provide content and you would assimilate it in and help produce videos and help other people do their things. Um, so uh, Green Race going forward, uh, it, it's, it's a thing, it's your, you're in love with it every year and it, it's, it's Yeah, you know, Green Race is, you know, I don't know how much bigger we can, Green Race can get. Um, you know, we've we've made sure to shift the focus of various things that happens with that community to conservation efforts and ways to help people who are helping, who are contributing to the gorge. You know, not necessarily only on the river, but to the canyon itself where everybody hikes in, the land managers, you know, all that kind of thing. So we really want to weave it into the fabric of the culture around here. I think that competitions wise, there are a few other competitions and ideas that I've had for a few years that I think are going to be primed to kind of unleash in the next little bit. Um, Don't spill the beans. I'm not. I'm, we'll, keeping, we'll, that, I'm keeping, that, keeping that down. But I think there's a lot of opportunity for comp, uh, competition and not just super high end competition, not just competitions that. 30 of the best in the world can do like you know that hundreds of people can participate in and you know you just get in on that river and you have one goal everything else shuts out 
I don't know, competition. Well, I'll tell you what, I, if, if you're open for one more idea, wild water racing on class three plus. Oh, yeah. On, like the lower golly, Ocoee. I, I was into wild water racing because that was a thing back then, and I loved it. I mean, there, like you said, you go out there on the river, you get focused, you build skills, and you it, and, and it's you're exerting. It's, good, good, clean living. Yeah. You're doing it. We just need some wild water boats around. Yeah, I don't know how you fix that. Yeah, we, I think we ought to get a mold and just get our hands dirty with fiberglass. We should. And maybe, maybe that'll be the Hammer Factor's first design. Oh, there we go. We'll call it the Hammer Factor. <laughs> <laughs> go out and hammer. Um, John, let's let's talk. Let's extend the conversation about you mentioned. The, you know the 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 broadening of the race to embrace to uh, include uh, protection of the land and. In, in the environment and the culture here, uh, you've you've taken more and more interest over the last five years in uh, protecting the Green River, and it's expanded to other rivers as well. But especially the Green, access trails to the Green, access parking for boaters on the Green, the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission manages all this forest up here as game lands. It was kind of a, originally acquired and designated for hunting and fishing. But the state authorities have embraced paddling as a recreation here, and you've, you've built awesome relationships with them. Talk, talk about the spirit of that and, and the great blue heron. Yeah. So this is a good, this is a, I could go, this could be a whole interview in itself, so you can stop me if I start rambling here. But... This is public land. It was paid for primarily by tax money, both federal and state and county. And it's managed as hunting and fishing land, but it's accessible to all public. Okay. What happens is there oftentimes people, oh, all I've done is figure out what these land managers want out of the land. And how they want it to be used is such a bad word because you don't use it. But how, how they want it to be enjoyed. And their interests are, you know, there seems to me like there's always this battle between fishermen and kayakers and this person and whatever. But when you just break it down, it's the exact same interest. It is so yeah. microscopically different, it's not even worth splitting hairs on it. It's just a matter of be, being considerate to what they're doing and then being considerate to what we're doing. And I think that the success that I've had in working with the land managers here is basically they never knew for all of these years, for the past 15 years or something, that we do a huge river cleanup. And I reached out to them one year and I said, hey guys, we do this huge river cleanup and we've, we've got, we're filling up all these trucks with trash out of the river. Can you bring a dumpster down? Really? You're doing a river cleanup? The guys never knew that. So then I started saying, hey, yeah, we're doing this. And then we'd, we'd go in and we'd clear out a section of trail. And I'd say, hey, we're working on this trail. We put in these water bars to prevent erosion. I just want to you know, show you and keep you up to date on what we're doing here. And then it expanded to the lower green and us, you know, whatever. And all of a sudden they realized that we were a user group that was putting a tremendous amount back in. You know, we weren't just logging or you know you doing you weren't just taking you were giving exactly yeah. and and once that started to happen and then they would they would have hey it's youth turkey hunt you know whatever you know i just want to make sure you don't have an event or something going on that day oh yeah no problem we won't touch that you know so it's just that back and forth and once they figured out we put on an event here a big mountain biking race at green river games and I was walking through the trails with some of the land managers. And there's the trail that goes down to Pulliam Creek. And they, at one time, thought that was a paddler access, a boater access, where oh. people put in and took out. And I told, I said, hey, this was really the turning point. I said, no, nobody comes in or out of there unless there's a problem. You know, I was like, this is like on the map. People hike in there. It's a beautiful place. People are hiking in there all the time. 
And it's not suitable to carry it's boats. Not, it's <laughs> not a boater access. But if, if, folks, if you haven't walked the Pulliam Creek <sighs> Trail down into the gorge, you'll see that it yeah. is not for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Especially and someone carrying a kayak. Exactly. And so they, after that, put up a game camera there because they were like, we're going to bust him. Oh. They decided they were going to, and I was being just 100% honest. And it was a May, it was a wet May, similar to this. Rained, I don't know, 20 days out of the month or something. And they, um, they documented some, um, they documented like 600 and something people who went in and out of the trail. And there was one guy who was a kayaker and he didn't have his boat. And you could obviously tell he swam or something out and he looked all disheveled and they showed me the picture. And ever since then, we've just had a great relationship and they know, they love, they are awesome. NC Wildlife, I've worked with National Park System on the Grand Canyon and the Everglades, National Forest System, uh, state parks. NC Wildlife is one of the greatest land management agencies and in my opinion, they do the most with the smallest amount of money. DuPont State Forest has a bigger budget than all of NC Wildlife across the entire state. Yeah. So when you start talking to them in terms of like what they're capable of and what they can really do, they're an awesome group. Well, and your, your, your love for this place, your spirit about the river, the experience, melds directly into protecting it and, and the surrounding forest. And it, it's a little miniature and wilderness up here. And expanding And expanding, expanding the forest. The, you know, yeah, the I'm, one of the big things I'm working on now is we're talking with those guys about, you know, over on the other side of Holbrook Cove Road, there's some game lands and there's some like prime sections. And I pointed out, hey, if you want to connect the forest and be able to have this part connect to this part, this part, this is a section that you should look to purchase if it ever comes on the market and work with those guys to get grants for various um, parking areas. Of course, we've donated money to them for access points with our events through the years. It's a give and take and, you know, it's, I guess when you're here all the time, you have the luxury of building those relationships, and that's really what it's about. And by the way, folks, um, if protecting the Green River appeals to you, every year with the Green Race, there's a, an element of that called the Green Race Conservation Project, which is an opportunity to go online. You don't even have to attend the race. And honor the work that John and other people do in protection. And just make simple online donations right there. Honor the racers, really. Yeah. You know, that's, uh, that's all about, you know, supporting the racers and, and the race. And people are into it, man. You know, people love this place. And, John, on the, your interests have expanded in the conservation area. I know you're very passionate about seeing the Nolichucky River uh, declared national wild and scenic. That's two hours north of here. Similarly beautiful river, not quite class five, but just a, an incredible canyon awesome place. Um, last year you dug out some suit and tie and went up to Washington DC and lobbied in Congress on behalf of the paddling community for the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which by the way proved successful. It, it wasn't just you obviously, there were many hundreds people. Hundreds and were. hundreds of people, yeah. Um, and, it, um, and so I know that this has become part of your passion and I know your cup runs over with various passions, but this is a great one to see. Um, I want to talk about safety a little bit. Your perspective on how safety has evolved in the sport, uh, what we can, we in the sport can do maybe better now. And I, I'll say this uh, by saying to the viewers that both John and I have lost people very close to us in whitewater boating accidents. And so it's, it's safety has become very real to us. Um, and we're both inspired to make the sport safer any way we can. But talk about your own experiences, your impressions of safety when you were a kid. Obviously, you had to develop big-time rescue uh, and safety skills. And a big part of safety is looking at a situation, know what to do and what not to do and so on. But talk a little bit about that uh, evolution for you and what you see going forward. This is what I would say. So... The river is the most forgiving place until it's not. And what I mean by that is you can be 
on a horrible section of white water and see these horrendous crashes and people fall on their heads and whatever and they're just fine. They either roll up and nothing happened or they swim and they're laughing and fist bumping their buddies. But on the cl tiniest class two, there can be a little sieve or a log that's in the wrong spot and it can trap you in a way that you know you don't you, you don't make it through it and that's the hard part about safety in kayaking is it's not like at a car wreck where you can pretty much understand that if you're in this harness in this and you're in this seat and that, there's airbags and, yeah that there's airbags that you can have this pretty predictable you know you can you can make sure that you can you can predict what's going to happen whitewater it's much harder i would say my biggest takeaway that i would offer anyone on safety in all of my years of kayaking is act swiftly and with much conviction if you see someone who's in trouble someone circulating in a hole don't sit in your boat and think oh they'll be fine immediately as soon as you see that get out of your boat start into the safety it's way better you know you have we used to do this segment in lvm's called 87 seconds and 87 seconds is how long a person can hold their breath until they involuntarily take a breath and so when you see something happening on the water the biggest mistake i see anyone make is they observe too long without taking action you have got to take action, and you've got to get your hands on that person any way that you can. I've seen that hundreds of times, and, and I, I totally agree. You know, and that's the biggest thing I can tell someone about safety. Um, outside of that, be with a strong group, and always make sure you got someone to back you up. You know, if you if someone gets pinned, and you jump out of your boat, you've got to know that your friends there with you are jumping out of their boat on the other side of the river to help you, and. To practice these skills and to go through these scenarios, there's a lot of good whitewater courses that do that. They're not necessarily like a standard swift water rescue classes, although those are great. Um, but if you can find someone, you know, some old river rat like me or someone out there like that to kind of be a mentor in safety, that is worth a bazillion bucks, in my opinion. Well, some of what you described earlier about uh, the expeditions and all, uh, a lot of it is about looking at a situation and know, being able to predict what the hazard is, what the risk is, and evaluating that and deciding based on super informed data that comes really from experience. You can't read about how to scout a rapid in a book and, and making the right decisions and trusting the others in the group to talk about that hazard mm -hmm. and, and make it. And that... That's something I've learned from, you know, I, I was not, there, w there was not class five paddling when I was coming along through my 20s and into my 30s, and then I started having kids. But uh, as I've engaged in the sport in more recent times, that's the thing that's really impressed me about your generation of paddlers, the ability to understand what's out there and how to manage it on the front end, rescue on the back end as well. Yeah, you know, and... I just think it needs to be understood that when you step up to class five, it is dangerous and you need to act like it is. And that's everything from scouting to actually paddling it to your teamwork down the river to the rescue. You know, yeah. you have to treat it how it is um, and not, not just think it's going to be all right or whatever. You, you know, if you actively realize that and actively are on edge, you know, this is something I do at the Green Race every year is I just make sure that in the meetings and the pre-parties and whatever, I, I like everybody to be on edge. I don't like people to be relaxed because I feel like that is when things spiral out of control. When everybody's, when everybody's heightened awareness, things, in my experience, turn out a lot. Well, and, uh, you know, the, the, the Green Race experience includes observing the incredible safety team that's in place. I mean, you, you've got like over 20 people that are on the safety crew that know exactly where to be. And these are, these are expert class five paddlers that aren't, choose not to race that day. They could race some of them, but instead they volunteer to run safety for the race. 
John, the, uh, you know, we do lo lose people. We lose friends, family, um, in whitewater accidents. And you've experienced some of that, and I've experienced some, and, uh, and it's super painful. But you, you and I are still paddling, and everything you described about the passion for the sport, talk a little bit about your own sort of con confrontation of the risk for yourself and how it's evolved. Well, personally, I want to say, Mark, that losing a child, I have never experienced that. And so my experience is going to be pale in, in comparison to yours. I just want to be totally up front with anybody who's watching well, this about that. Well, thank you acknowledging that. Um, but what I will say is that whitewater makes great people. And sometimes you lose people who have a connection to you and whatnot, but that doesn't mean that that doesn't mean that you're gonna sacrifice all of that incredible community and that time. You know, if we all have a timeline, it's this long. Some of some of us are shorter or longer than others. If you decide, if I, I'm midway through my timeline and I decide that I'm no longer going to be on the river and whatever because of this accident, to me, this side of the timeline, if I were to step away from that, wouldn't be as valuable. I mean, that's all I've got is that It timeline. would change your life. It would change my life and whatnot. And maybe you can see that as selfish. It could probably be portrayed different ways, but... It's a choice of what you're going to do with your time and to not, to, to make that conscious to so, choice. Hey, you know, I'll, I'll be more conservative. You know, definitely when compounding things happen, when you know one person who's passed away a second, it, it has a compounding effect. Um, but I do think that um, if I were to just quit No More River for John, thinking about my timeline, the re what I've got left, it wouldn't be the way I want to spend it. I, I don't know how else to explain it. Well, that that sentiment, that spirit was so powerful. We lost a friend, good friend, Maria Noakes, a little over two years ago on the Chioa River. She was a neighbor of yours. And at the memorial event, I think, didn't we count over 400 people attended? Yeah, at it least. Was, it was huge. and. The spirit of community was never stronger in my experience. I've never, you know, I've, I've said this several times, the togetherness of those friends, the, the community around paddling that drove or flew from far away to come be together for that moment, to, to honor Maria, to remember Maria, but also to, to reinforce our own bonds together was huge. And I think that's kind of what you're saying Whitewater makes great people. It makes great community, and that's that's kind of where we are. It would just, it would just, you know, I, I, I don't think everything has to make sense. Some things have got to go on a feeling, and you know, maybe you change how you approach the river, or maybe you change how you approach paddling. Not everybody paddles at the top of their game. I certainly don't paddle at the same level I paddled 15 years ago, but that doesn't mean you just quit. Right, you know. So, well, I'll tell you, I I'll wake up every week <laughs> trying to maintain skills. I'm a little few years on you, but I, you know, it's it is super vital to me to stick with it and to stick with the people and the and the challenge. And even you know, I raced once last year. Even the all the elements are still so vital to my life, and and that's that's where you are. Yeah, John, let's. Uh, Let's pull it to an end here. I want to thank you again. I, I hope viewers and listeners here um, that maybe are more of my generation that are, <laughs> that now have a window into a little more of the current state of of the sport and the endeavor here in the Southern Appalachians. Um, and John, as we discussed earlier, maybe 25 years or so from now, we'll do another interview and get another retrospective about how things have changed since way back in 2020. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, it's, it's great to see Whitewater change. It's great to be a part of it, you know, contribute where I can. You know, I tell people all the time, I've been trying to quit kayaking for 
30 years now, you know, and it's just a part of me. I, it'll, I'll always be involved with it, and, you know, there was a, a time when I really didn't accept, I didn't think that was acceptable, but now I think it's necessary. Yeah. So. Well, that's a, a great way to wrap things up. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you, Mark.